All right. You say, what are we disagreeing about? Is Catholicism a mind virus? Well, it, 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 it's a complex of mind viruses, yes. That's what we're disagreeing about. Okay. Okay, my claim is that Catholicism is a complex of adaptations. My argument has been religions are compendiums of a kind of wisdom, but that that wisdom is non-literal. So that when we evaluate the content of, let's say, a biblical text, if we look at it with respect to did these events occur, then we will dismiss it. If we say, what would the effect on an individual be of believing that these events had occurred, the effect would be positive from the point of view of their genetic fitness. That is to say, how well they are able to serve their genetic interests would be enhanced by believing in these structures. The new atheists like Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins have for years led the charge against religious fundamentalism and dogmatism, and for that they deserve a great deal of credit. But as I'm going to attempt to prove in this video, because they are armed with an outdated understanding of evolutionary theory, they have a distorted conception of religion as a kind of mind virus, in that they believe it is nothing more than a regressive set of superstitious Stone Age beliefs that humanity should do away with. But the reality, as I understand it, and as Brett Weinstein claims, is that ancient religions are actually adaptive features of evolution, meaning they evolved because they increase the genetic fitness of their practitioners, and they contain far more evolutionary wisdom than we realize. And in this video, we're going to come away with some crucial insights into behaviors like celibacy in Catholic priests. Well, worker bees don't reproduce. Right. Priests you theoretically don't homosexuality, and disgust sensitivity and its relationship to genocide. But let's start with how the new atheists have an outdated understanding of evolutionary theory. And this has to do with two opposing views of natural selection. Individual selection, or selection at the level of the gene, and group selection, or selection for the good of the species. Now, without getting too into the weeds on this, you have to understand that there is essentially a civil war amongst biologists who fall into either of these two camps. The new atheists fall strongly into the individual slash kin selection model, while other biologists favor group selection, otherwise known as multi-level selection. I guess the, the debate that you're most famous for is the group, you know, what used to be called group selection, now multi-level selection, where a wide range of famous evolutionists would disagree with you. This is one of the rare cases where I actually read material by, by either side. And as I read their position, I go, yeah, I buy that. And then I read the other side and I go, yeah, I kind of buy that. So on the other hand, when it comes to this debate, you have incredibly sophisticated thinkers on both sides that yet, that yet can't seem to convince one another to move one millimeter in their positions. Here is Robert Sapolsky to explain what group selection and individual selection are and why group selection is wrong. So you've got this wonderful herd of two million wildebeest and there's a problem, which is there's some great field right in front of them full of grass and bummer, there's a river in between them and the next field. And especially a bummer, a river teeming with crocodiles just ready to grab them. So what are the wildebeest going to do? And according to the National Geographic type specials we would get, out would come a solution. There's all the wildebeest hemming and hawing in this agitated state by the end, edge of the river. And suddenly, from the back of the crowd, comes this elderly wildebeest who pushes his way up to the front, stands on the edge of the river, and says, I sacrifice myself for you, mine kinder, and throws himself into the river, where immediately the crocs get busy eating him up, and the other two million wildebeest could tiptoe around the other way across the river and everybody's fine. And you're then saying, why'd this guy do this? Why did this guy fling himself into the river? And we would always get the answer at that point. The answer that is permeated as like the worst urban myth of evolution, whatever. Why did he do that? Because animals behave for the good of the species. This is the notion that has to be completely trashed right now. Animals behave for passing on as many copies of their genes as possible. And what we'll see is when you start looking at the nuances of that, sometimes it may look like behaving for the good of the species, but it really isn't the case. 
So the idea that Sapolsky is driving home is that organisms do not engage in behaviors that are for the good of the species or the good of their group. They engage in behaviors that are beneficial for maximizing the number of copies of genes they leave in the next generation. And sometimes that can look like group evolution because cooperation between individuals in a group does benefit the group or the species, so to speak. But that's a secondary consequence of providing benefit to the individuals who, because of cooperation, are more likely to be able to leave new copies of genes. But here's where I want to introduce a, what is in principle, revolutionary concept in the field of evolutionary theory. And that is Brett Weinstein's idea of lineage selection, which I will let him explain now. I don't want to drag you or our viewers too deeply into the weeds here. But my claim is that my field is divided between two camps that are incorrect. One camp are the kin selectionists, right? People who view this as narrowly genetic. These are my intellectual ancestors. And the other group are the group selectionists who have understood something else, which is that essentially altruism pays. And there are certain places you can stand that it appears that that is a driving evolutionary force. Whereas mathematically, it is very difficult to make a robust model of this sort, at least not a realistic one. My point would be the kin selectionists have understood one part of the logic correctly, but they've instantiated it too narrowly. The group selectionists have found a fiction, but just as we were describing 15 minutes ago, that fiction has actually given them license to explore a very fertile piece of evolutionary territory, which is the landscape of cultural evolution, right? Cultural evolution does not make a tremendous amount of sense through the narrowest kin selected lens. It makes a great deal of sense through the um, group selected lens, but the gateway is fictional. So I would argue that the right way of viewing this is something called lineage selection. Now a lineage is an individual and all of that individual's descendants. On this point, I want to acknowledge the interesting connection between this idea and Jordan Peterson's idea of individuals being a community across time. You can't just think of yourself as you today. You're also you a year from now and you 10 years from now. He thought of people as four-dimensional entities, especially, essentially, that were stretched across time. And that you as a totality across time, including your potential, manifested yourself also in the here and now. And that part of what your potential manifested itself was something like the voice of conscious, conscience or intuition. Peterson argues that we evolve the instinct of meaning to know when we are engaged in behavior that is optimal for all versions of the individual across time. I think one could extend this idea and say that evolution selected this instinct of meaning not just to tell us when we are doing what is good for our future selves, but by extension, our future genetic lineage. This, I believe, is the fundamental synthesis between Brett Weinstein and Jordan Peterson's worldviews. But I'll let Brett continue his explanation of lineage selection. And my point is, that is actually a valid uh, target of evolution. Lineages can evolve just the same way individuals can evolve. So we can see adaptation at the lineage level, which will look like, if you don't pay close enough attention to what you're looking at, it may look like group evolution, which is in part why the group selectionists have gotten themselves confused. So the point is, if we really understood the mindset of the individual in rational evolutionary terms, we would understand that they, in some sense, will be built. They will be wired and programmed to behave in such a way both to advance their own genetic interests and to protect the long-term uh, population well-being that allows those genes to circulate, right? They will effectively be protecting a gene pool. So now let's get into the most important part of this video, which is what are the implications of this lineage selection model? Remember, for decades, people like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris argued that religious behavior celibacy in priests or martyrdom, people blowing themselves up for a religion. All of those are maladaptive behaviors from the new atheist perspective. And that makes sense because if you're celibate or you blow yourself up for superstitious, superstitious reasons, you're not gonna be able to pass on copies of your genes. But when you look at these behaviors from a lineage level perspective in that, how does this behavior affect not just the next generation of my genes, but all of the genes going out into perpetuity of my entire lineage, Suddenly this starts to make sense. Let's go back to Richard Dawkins and Brett Weinstein's debate over celibacy in Catholic priests. Number seven, I really wanna know your reaction to this one. I've been waiting all night. Um, Catholics, are you social? Does everybody in the audience understand what the claim is? That you have a non-reproductive caste within 
Catholicism, other religions too, but Catholics are uh, kind to us in that they make everything so elaborate that we can... Well, worker bees don't reproduce. Right. You priests do... theoretically don't. Yeah, priests theoretically don't, and neither do none. Well, I think most of them probably don't. <laughs> don't you agree? Yes. Yeah. So, all right, the question is, you know, you allege in The Selfish Gene that a celibate clergy is a failure of Darwinian selection. My claim here is that this isn't a failure, that this is adaptive celibacy, that it serves a lineage-level purpose. This is my claim, is that it is almost always going to be the case in any persistent religion that where you have people engaged in what appears to be some spectacular failure of Darwinism, that they just so happen to be spreading ideas that will result in the genes that are allowing them to fail as Darwinian entities to succeed by the lineage that holds those they, beliefs. They devote all their energies to spreading Catholic memes and they, they don't have to bother with the, the time and the responsibilities of a family. So they're, they're wholly devoted to spreading Catholic memes, including incidentally, more than incidentally, the meme for celibacy. Well, they so spread the meme for celibacy, which my claim, I mean, if I'm right about this, then my point would be that Catholic, uh, Catholic lineages would actually do less well, well if everybody reproduced, that there is an advantage to having individuals who have stepped out of the reproductive market and therefore become capable of speaking on behalf of the lineage. This idea of adaptive celibacy that Catholic priests, for example, serve as sort of a worker caste, like worker bees in a beehive, and instead of having offspring can devote their time towards the benefit of the lineage. It maps on to genetic explanations of, for example, homosexuality and this helper at the nest model, which is basically that families that have gay siblings are more likely to be successful because that sibling can devote time towards the benefit of the family and their kin rather than having to devote time to their own offspring. Here's Robert Sapolsky to explain. You can immediately run your numbers argument there that as long as the benefits for the other kind of sibling or gender is larger than the detriment here, this is going to be selected for. What would that look like? Where is the evidence for that? What one would predict is that you would see for gay men that their sis sisters have a higher than average reproductive rate. And that is absolutely there in the literature. So the people who push for this view would say, aha, there is some sort of trait which in a male increases the likelihood manifesting as homosexuality in a female as some route by which there is increased reproductive success. The third model is the helper at the nest model, which is that the individual who traditionally is not passing on copies of their own genes directly, instead what they're doing is expending resources on helping their siblings. Okay, so that kind of sounds like the second model also. What's the difference? The second model says that sisters of gay men should have increased reproductive rates. What the third model, the helping at the nest model, suggests is both sisters and brothers should have increased reproductive rates, and that's actually what's mostly been seen. And while this is interesting, I think the most important distinction between Dawkins and Weinstein's point of views are how they explain and understand the evolutionary nature of something like genocide. Dawkins believes that genocide is a mere byproduct of our nature and not something inbuilt to our psychology that evolved for adaptive reasons, whereas Weinstein takes the opposite perspective. So to give one example, let's say that the impulse to genocide is something that lurks inside human beings, awaiting certain indicators that it is the moment for that program to be triggered. Were that the case, you would want people to engage that question ahead of time when they were in possession of their full faculties and to recognize that they might have a program within them that violates the values that they believe are their, their guide. Yes, but I think I would prefer to say that these impulses are byproducts of something primitive and evolved. So something like genocide. Um, we know that chimpanzees, for example, um, do practice genocide against rival groups of, of, ch of chimpanzees. Of course, I agree with you that the, the, we need to resist the, we need to rebel against the, the selfish genes, but I prefer not to talk about the things that we do in our modern society in a sort of straightforward biological way, but rather to say these are relics, byproduct relics of our genetic 
past. But one reason I don't believe the genocide as a byproduct or evolutionary spandrel idea is because there is strong evidence to suggest that genocidal impulses and behaviors are a function of the extended immune system, the psychological mechanism associated with disgust of foreign entities, which are often carriers of disease. And if this is the case, the genocidal impulse is actually an adaptive feature of evolution because it would encourage individuals to wipe out people who carry disease. Here's Jordan Peterson to explain. One of the things about Hitler was that he was very disgust sensitive and a lot of his hatred for non-Aryans. So imagine inside the Aryan box, it was all uniform. Outside it was all parasites and predators. And so, and that was a manifestation of disgust, not of fear. It's a whole different thing. And if you read Hitler's table talk, which is a collection of his spontaneous dinner speeches from 1939 to 1942, it's a very interesting book. You see that his metaphor for the Aryan race was a body, a pure body, unassaulted by parasites or predators, and that he was trying to er erect a border around it to keep all of that away. So it's an immunological disgust-like metaphor. And there's some recent work that was published in PLOS One about three years ago, showing that brilliant study, should have got much more attention, showing that if you went around and, and, and sampled political attitudes in different countries, or even within the same country, what you found was that the higher the prevalence of infectious diseases, the higher the probability of totalitarian political attitudes at the local level. And you can imagine, well, what happens if there's infectious diseases is you want to put borders around everything. You don't want free movement between ideas or people because that's partly how the disease spreads. You're going to have much more strict sexual rules, for example, because that's a great way for diseases to be transmitted. And the reason that this is such an important concept to understand is because in order to prevent genocide, we have to understand what the psychological and biological and evolved mechanisms are within us that would cause people to do that. If we pretend that things that contribute to genocide, like nationalism and religion, are just mere byproducts of cultural evolution, rather than something that is specifically adapted for the sake of genetic lineages, then we miss out on understanding all of these things in a much more clear and correct context. So with all that in mind, is it fair to say that new atheism is a mind virus, not religion? Well, according to Brett Weinstein, yeah. On stage, I told Dawkins that religions that have existed for thousands of years cannot be mind viruses, but that new atheism can. And I really believe this. New atheism is novel. It has not stood the test of time. And in fact, it creates a problem for many of us who might otherwise be willing to be called atheists because it has taken on uh, an ideological fervor. And so if there's any hardcore atheists watching this video who have unfortunately been infected by the mind virus known as new atheism, all I'd like to say is good luck and Godspeed. <laughs>